So, Dr. Nicoltonio, how did we get it so wrong about salt? How did we go from thinking that it was the enemy to now you're saying it's not? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, basically all our nutritional whiplash that we're dealing with that, you know, all of a sudden fat's good and cholesterol's okay and now salt might be okay, it's, you know, it really stems from those 1977 dietary goals where, you know, Senator George McGovern, he basically tasked um, Nick Modern, who really had no scientific background, no nutritional background, and mm -hmm. to write uh, basically dietary guidelines for all Americans back 40 years ago before we had any evidence mm. on that or you know, salt or anything. And, you know, really it just comes down to those those dietary goals were put out for everybody to go on a low salt diet and it really just carried over into the dietary guidelines, which gets updated every five years. So was it based on any science or was it just sort of like, I think salt's bad, we should stop eating it, right? Was it was more than that, right? Isn't there yeah. studies that show that salt was linked to hypertension and chronic disease? I mean what what about all that data that was used to make those recommendations? Right, and so it kind of like similar with uh, the demonization of fat. Um, we had uh, Louis Dahl, who was kind of like the Ansel Keys of salt. And so I don't know what was in the water in the 1950s, but basically <laughs> Louis Dahl did the same thing with salt that yeah. Ansel Keys did with mm -hmm. fat. And mm -hmm. cherry picking populations and drawing a straight line showing that, you know, in just five populations, as salt intake increased, the prevalence of hypertension increased. And of course, you know, 20, 30 years later, we had Intersol, which looked at 48 countries, not just five, and actually mm. as salt intake increased, blood pressure actually uh, decreased. And so, you know, studies went back and forth, and there was all these salt wars, you know, back in the 1900s in the book that kind of go through, you know, how, you know, we had some doctors saying, yep, when I put my patients on low salt diets, their blood pressure goes down, and then we had other doctors saying it didn't happen. And so we never just really had any good solid proof that a low salt diet prevents high blood pressure or strokes or heart attacks. Mm. I mean like the DASH diet, well that's the diet, but it's also low salt, right? Which is dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Part of that was a low salt diet. Right, and so that's a good point. And, and kind of what, what's been happening, Mark, is we, they've been hyper-focusing on the minimal benefits of a reduction in blood pressure when we cut our salt intake. And in the book, I kind of show you're just dehydrating that person. It's not even a good thing that you're lowering their blood pressure when you cut your salt intake because heart rate goes up and you're just mm -hmm. reducing their blood volume. It's not a good reduction in blood pressure. Yeah. And so actually like vascular resistance in the arteries actually stiffen on a low salt diet. We become insulin resistant. Even that famous DASH study showed that the total cholesterol to HDL ratio worsened on a low salt diet and right. triglycerides went up because low salt diets cause metabolic syndrome. And one of the reasons why it does that is because uh, low salt diets cause insulin resistance because mm. that's our body's defense mechanism. What's the mechanism of that? Yeah, it's so the kidneys can retain more salt. Uh, the body becomes insulin resistant to elevate insulin levels because insulin helps those the kidneys to not just uh, you know retain more salt, but it also obviously right. causes to store fat. That's a really important point. You know, I found, you know, when writing my book and doing the research on it, on Eat Fat, Get Thin, with my patients, that when they change their diet and cut out the starch and sugar, which causes also insulin resistance and makes you retain salt and water because the insulin retains salt, they started dumping salt. They started dumping water. They lost weight, uh, but they didn't feel so good. And so I always tell people who are eating a higher fat diet and very low carbohydrate diets to actually dramatically increase their salt intake. Yeah, no, that's a huge point is, you know, a lot of people are suffering with the keto flu. Um, and really, it's mainly due to salt efficiency, right? Because the, when insulin levels drop, when you cut your carbohydrate intake, um, you know, that just flushes the kidneys out with salt. And, and ketone bodies are negatively charged. They'll pull positively charged sodium ions with them. And so really, the first few weeks of a low-carb diet, you yeah. dramatically yeah. Uh, lose a lot of salt and water. But also, the reduction in dietary glucose reduces the absorption of salt. And so there's this chronic mechanism where you're not even absorbing salt when you cut your carbohydrate intake as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. So, you know, we've all learned about the harms of eating too much salt, but you're saying there's harms from having not enough salt in your diet. What's, up, what's with that? Right, yeah, so I mean, when you look at all of the studies, I mean, even those who are consuming the highest amounts of salt, like six, seven, even 8,000 milligrams of sodium, 
the, the increase in coronary heart disease mortality is only like 20%. But if you look at actually following the American Heart Association advice or the CDC um, going below 2,300 milligrams, you can see a doubling in coronary heart disease mortality. So, so even when you look at the harms of, of a very high salt diet, it's much less dramatic than the harms of a low salt diet. Yeah. And so some of the reasons is because the, the kidneys can just flush out any salt that they don't need. So we have, we have a lot of mechanisms, safety mechanisms, to either absorb and downregulate the amount of salt we absorb if we have too much. Yeah. The intestines can signal uh, you know, the kidneys to also flush out more salt when we don't need it. Um, the problem is we can't manufacture an essential mineral, right? So when you don't have enough salt, you're kind of out of luck. Yeah. And because it's an extracellular mineral, it can be flushed out of the body very easily. So caffeine, uh, yeah. just can four cups of coffee can cause us to lose over a full teaspoon of salt in wow. just four hours of urine. Um, and we sweat it out, right? Like when we, I mean, exercise is one of the best things we can do for our health, and yet we can sweat out a half a teaspoon to a full teaspoon of salt per hour of exercise. Wow, so exercise and coffee are out, right? <laughs> no, right? Exactly. Well, what's so funny is the American Heart Association tells people to exercise. They want them to exercise an hour a day, and yet they're telling them to eat basically less than a half a teaspoon of salt. And you lose more than a half a teaspoon of salt in an hour of exercise. And so the, the literally when you do the math, you're just, you're just depleting someone of salt. If you follow both the American Heart Association's low salt advice and their advice to exercise an hour a day. So a lot of people are dehydrated and, and then they're intracellularly dehydrated, meaning their cells don't have enough fluid in them, which makes you feel like crap. So will salt help that? Yeah, absolutely. And electrolytes? Um, yeah, so sugar is one of the worst, um, actually, offenders at depleting intracellular volume. And so basically glucose pulls water from the tissue into the blood vessel. So really, sugar, we blame the wrong white crystal. Absolutely, sugar is what's causing an overretention of fluid, not salt. Um, it's crazy to think. And, I mean, there's, there's studies even by Tim Noakes who show that when you're exercising, uh, consuming uh, 2,300 milligrams per liter of volume intake uh, does improve hydration. And that's because um, without salt, you can't hold on to water. Right. And so salt absolutely hydrates the body. Yeah, so salt in, in gives you more ability to actually maintain your hydration because it hold, like it's like the glue that holds the water in your cells. Um, so who does need to consume more salt? Yeah, so, I mean, in the book, I kind of go through some of the main um, populations that are at risk of salt deficiency. But you know, starting out, I know you're kind of, um, you know, you're really into the gut, gut health, inflammatory bowel disease. Yeah. And people with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, they do not absorb salt well at all because of the damage to the intestine, right? Mm -hmm. Because we absorb salt in the intestine and the colon. Yeah. And so people with celiacs as well who have damage to the intestine and people with IBS don't absorb salt very well. Hmm. Um, and then you also have people who've had their part of their small intestine removed or people mm -hmm. with bariatric surgery or even people who've had part of their colon removed from yeah. colon cancer at our very high risk of salt deficiency because they don't absorb it well. And then you have people that are losing um, salt uh, via kidney damage. So what people don't understand is that the kidneys, their main job, 60 to 70 percent of the kidneys function every single day is to reabsorb the three and a half pounds of salt that they filter. And so when you eat more salt, the kidneys are like, thank you. I can just let any extra salt go. I don't have to actively reabsorb it. When you get damage to the kidneys from consuming a diet high in refined carbs and sugar, you're damaging those tubules that help you reabsorb the salt. And you can start spilling salt in the urine. Mm. Um, adrenal insufficiency that causes us to lose salt. Uh, Stress, right? Stress. Stress. Untreated sleep apnea at night. The, those patients lose twice the amount of salt at night. Um, and, and hypothyroidism. Thyroid hormones are extremely important for the kidneys to reabsorb salt. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So um, you said something in the book that was sort of fascinating to me, that sort of salt is sort of the antidote to sugar addiction, which I talk about a lot. I've written a lot about how sugar is biologically addictive, that we get hooked on it, that it affects the brain the same way as cocaine or heroin. And, and you're suggesting that we can use another white powder, <laughs> white crystal, to actually fix that problem. How does that work? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And there is definitely like this yin and yang between salt and sugar. I mean, literally, salt seems to be that good white crystal and the antidote to the bad white crystal, sugar. And so, you know, nature has given us this natural white substance to kind of combat this other one. And so what ends up happening is 
how do, like how does an animal know to go out to a salt lick and, and yeah. eat salt right when it's depleted? And what ends up happening is the reward system in the brain gets hyperactivated when we become deficient in salt. And so unfortunately, sugar can hijack that activated reward system. Mm. And so studies in animals have shown that salt deficiency can cross-sensitize with substances of abuse like Adderall, cocaine, and potentially makes those um, substances even more addictive because they're more rewarding. And so yeah. reward drives dopamine release and drives crashes of dopamine, which can lead to that vicious cycle of dependency and addiction. And so literally adding more salt can potentially reduce sugar cravings and our preference for sweet foods. That's unbelievable. So essentially being salt deficient makes your brain more sensitive to addictive substances. It makes you crave them more like sugar, which is pretty unbelievable. And I think, you know, we don't think about that. We don't, we, we're afraid of the salt shaker. You know, it's like the devil. And yet uh, we, we just have this thing right at our disposal, which is pretty amazing. So, you know, there's lots of salt out there, right? We have um, iodized salt, you know, Morton salts, what everybody uses. There's sea salt, there's Himalayan salt, there's black salt. I mean, it's confusing. So even I'm confused. What, what salt should we be using? Yeah, so I mean, taking it a step like back, just regular old table salt is highly processed. And I didn't even realize this until a few years ago. I mean, if you look at the back of like your, your regular table salt, there's dextrose added to it. Um, it's highly refined and they treat it with very high heat and it's just pure sodium chloride. There's no other minerals in it. Um, and when you look at other salts, what I recommend in the book is this, this Redmond real salt. It's from an ancient ocean. And so a lot of people are really into these sea salts, right? But the problem is, is they're from modern day oceans. And there's been numerous studies done now that sea salts from modern day oceans can contain modern day pollution. So they literally mm. can have microplastics, nanoplastics, mm. even traces of heavy metals. Wow. And if you're, so if you can source it from an ancient ocean, like Redmond Real Salt, then you're not dealing with any of those type of... Uh, where, you know, where is an ancient ocean? <laughs> yeah, well, this particular ancient ocean is in um, Utah, in Redmond, oh. Utah. Oh. And so it's, it's actually pretty cheap for being an unrefined um, salt. And it actually has really good amounts of iodine and calcium, which is why I like it as well. And, and I use it to dose myself before exercise. So how much do you take before exercise? Yeah, so... What I like to do is generally I work out for about 45 minutes to an hour and depending on, it doesn't even matter if I'm running or lifting heavy weights, I will use uh, about half a teaspoon of Redmond Real Salt and I'll add just enough lemon juice to coat it and I'll put about two ounces of water and take it like a lemon shot. But some people can just take it straight. Kind of depends on your palate, right? Yeah, salty water. Wow, that's impressive. A half a teaspoon. Seems like a lot. Yeah, but I mean, that's what we, what we lose on average per hour of exercise is a half a teaspoon of salt. And none mm. of the sports drinks even come close to having that amount of salt. Yeah, no, I, I notice when I, I take a electrolyte uh, cocktail of magnesium, sodium, and, and potassium, and it's like, you know, it's like you get a huge boost of energy and the fatigue goes away. If, you know, if you're playing tennis in the hot sun or something and you go for a bike ride, it just phenomenal in terms of how different it makes you feel almost instantly uh and i think most people don't realize that they could you know use electrolytes and salt to help them actually feel better have more energy uh perform better in so many ways uh so what about the iodine issue because you know we take away the iodine you talk about the redmond salt which has got iodine but most you know salts that people are using that are not iodized salt don't have iodine and we had a whole epidemic of goiters and issues how, how do you sort of reconcile that yeah, no, it's a great point. So a lot of people think that sea salt is very high in iodine because mm. seafood is high in iodine, and it's mm. actually the exact opposite. Yeah, sea salt um, actually has virtually no iodine, and so even the iodized table salt, the actual iodine is artificial iodine. It's potassium iodide, and some some uh, studies have shown that the bioavailability might be less than ten percent. Whereas if you can mm. get real iodine, which is found in Redmond Real Salt, the bioavailability of that iodine may actually be like 100%. It always goes to show you, when we try to artificially copy nature, mm. we, we never seem to like even come close to what the real benefits are of like, you know, a natural mineral contained in salt. Kind of messes us up, right? It does. Yeah. So, um, iodine from fish and seaweed is probably better to add to your diet. Yeah. Yep. 
What about the patients I have, you know, we, we have who have heart failure, who have, you know, salt sensitive hypertension, which you can actually look at the genes for, like, are those people more at risk for salt issues? Yeah. So, I mean, so really what my book is about is using real salt to eat real food and exercise more. And so if, if you have heart failure, what ends up happening is 25% of people with heart failure actually are at risk of low sodium levels in the blood. Mm. Uh, they actually generally need more salt, even though they're retaining salt more, they're actually over retaining water and are at mm. risk of hyponatremia. Yeah. So what ends up happening is, um, you know, patients with high blood pressure and salt sensitive high blood pressure, generally it's due to the insulin resistance caused by this high carbohydrate, high yeah. sugar diet. And you cut yeah. the sugar and you can fix the salt sensitive hypertension. It's such an easy fix. Yeah, that's powerful. So. Um, the other thing you saw, sort of wrote about was uh, fascinating was about putting salt in your coffee. And I remember being in Tibet and they had salty butter tea. Uh, what's up with that? Yeah, I mean, salt kind of cuts bitterness, right? And so coffee can be a little bitter. And in a lot of restaurants, actually, people don't know this. They're always like, man, I, I love this coffee when I go to this restaurant. Because generally they use just a little bit of salt. Um, and that's because it cuts the bitterness of it and actually can provide a little bit of sweetness. And so, yeah, I mean, you can use up to probably one eighth of a teaspoon of salt per three cups of coffee. I wouldn't go more than that. Um, but yeah, some people like a little pinch of mineral salt in their coffee in the morning. So I should put it in my coffee that they're ground up and put it in the, in the coffee machine. Is it going to mess up the coffee machine? <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you, yeah, I don't think it would uh, mess up the coffee, coffee machine. No, it shouldn't. That's pretty That's amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So. Um, what, what are great ways to include more salt in your diet and how much should we be including? I mean, do we want to two, five teaspoons a day? You know, how much? Right. Well, if you look at, um, Japan and South Korea who live the longest, right, they consume between four and 5,000 milligrams of sodium per day. They're the highest salt eating populations in the world. And yet they live the longest and have the lowest rates of coronary heart disease mortality. So mm. just from that perspective, I don't even know why we ever feared salt, even the Mediterranean diet is not a low salt diet, right? It's high in seafood and clams and cheese and olives and you know anchovies and all these salty foods, yeah. right? And yeah. really that's how you wanna integrate um, salt in your diet is eating real real salty foods or you can add real salts to taste. And, and I mean my kids, anyone, any parent out there knows their kids are not gonna eat bitter vegetables or nuts or seeds without adding some salt to it, right? But we're so afraid of salt, we'd rather give them low salt junk food. Um, yeah. Now, what about, you know, Michael Moss's book, uh, Salt, Sugar, and Fat, about the role of the food industry putting these ingredients in our foods to make them more addictive? Do, like, do you know about that book? And, like, what's your take on the whole salt thing? Because it is something that's added heavily to processed food. Correct. And really what I always go, come back to, Mark, is don't blame salt for what the sugar did. Yes, processed foods are high in salt. But that's not, the salt isn't the issue. It's yeah. the carbs and the sugar that are causing you to over-retain the salt. If you dr drop the processed carbs and sugar, it, the salt should be completely fine. That's amazing. So, you know, what were the most surprising things to you that you found in writing the book, The Salt Fix? Which, by the way, is a pretty amazing book. I encourage everybody to go get a copy because... You know, it'll turn your world upside down and it'll also make you feel a lot better when you change from salt restriction to including salt. And I, by the way, I got like five different kinds of salt in my kitchen. I use it liberally with all the food I cook. I sprinkle it on. I've got crystals, Himalayan salt, black salt, all kinds of salt. And it's like, it just makes food taste good and I don't worry about it. And my blood pressure is like 90 over 60. That's awesome. That's such a testament. And it sounds like you got this salt mixology going on. And really, yeah. you know. And I'm an old guy, like 50, you know, 57. I, you know, most guys my age have blood pressures like 140 over 90, but I don't eat sugar and starch very much. And, uh, and I include a lot of salt and it just seems to work. Yeah, I think honestly, one of the, the most uh, kind of impressive things that I found is that the people that have been messaging me after reading the book, saying, you know, Dr. D, I had muscle cramps, muscle spasms, or heart palpitations for three years. No mm. one knew what was going on. Mm. Within three days of upping my salt intake, it all went away. Yeah. And so really, that was the, actually the catalyst which started me writing the book is when I was a community pharmacist, my patients were coming up to me with these symptoms of salt deficiency because their doctors had put them on low-salt diets for high, mm -hmm. high blood pressure. 
And yet within a few days of upping their salt intake, boom, everything kind of went away. So yeah, these muscle cramps, especially at night, um, so many people have messaged me like they, they go away when yeah. I increase salt intake. And really it's because we don't realize how much salt we lose through sweat, through caffeine, through these low carb diets um, and medications and disease states that cause salt loss. But one of the really cool things I think you'll appreciate this is if we don't have enough salt, we actually lose magnesium and calcium from the body. Yeah. And so what ends up happening is More when we low, yeah, no, exactly. When we go on a low salt diet, um, in order to maintain a normal sodium level in the blood, the body starts pulling sodium from other places. And one of the places that pulls sodium from is the bone. And yet these osteoclasts, they're not smart enough to just strip sodium. They end up pulling magnesium and calcium with them. So what mm. I like to try to, a lot of people are like, well, magnesium and potassium, those are the best minerals. Well, you, can, you actually can't maintain your magnesium status unless you have ample amounts of salt. And so we even sweat out more magnesium and calcium on low salt diets because it's the body's defense mechanism to hold on to the salt through, in sweat and start sweating out more magnesium and calcium. So really, low salt diets are like the worst thing you can do for your magnesium and calcium levels in your body. And by the way, so many people are low in magnesium, which has so many different symptoms from headaches to constipation to insomnia to anxiety to palpitations to muscle cramps, all of which are common symptoms that people have and they don't realize it's a magnesium deficiency and all the things we do in our culture, alcohol, caffeine, sugar, stress, all cause us also deplete magnesium. So we're in this kind of mineral deficiency state most of the time, sodium, magnesium, potassium, Potassiums from plant foods, vegetables, which most of us don't eat enough of. Who eats, you know, eight cups of vegetables a day? I do, but probably most people don't. So I think I think that's uh, it's really a groundbreaking, paradigm shifting book. Uh, which, by the way, you know, you, you really, uh, you know, rarely see a book like this in my view that it's so groundbreaking and so paradigm shifting because it's so against our conventional wisdom. It's so against what the government recommends, what American Heart Association recommends, what your doctor recommends, what nutritionists recommend. Uh, and, and we've had all these unintended consequences from this, like just like we've had from the low-fat diet craze. Uh, and it's a very similar story, it sounds like, of how we got it so wrong. And, and you sort of really brought to light why we got it wrong and what to do about it. And the good thing is it's an easy fix. I, what I'm telling people to do is hard, which is stop eating sugar. You're saying just add salt, which makes your food taste good. Not so hard uh, sell. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's great. Any, any last thoughts you have that you want to share, what you found in your work that, that we should know about? Yeah, it was, the other interesting thing is, which I think you'll appreciate, is um, you know, a lot of people understand that salt equals sodium, but they forget about the other essential mineral in salt, chloride. And mm. chloride is what makes up hydrochloric acid. And so when you go on low salt diet, studies have literally shown that you there's a reduction in stomach acid. And so you're probably not able to digest food as well, absorb nutrients as well, and potentially prevent bacterial overgrowth. And so, you know, these minerals are essential. And if we don't get enough of them, we can't just manufacture them. And so it's very important that we're getting an optimal amount. That's unbelievable, right? That's something that we we don't even think about it was the other side of the equation, which is chloride in your gut. So it's all connected, which is really powerful, and beautiful. So what, what research are you most excited about that you're engaged in right now that, you know, we're going to look at for coming forward from you? Yeah. So, um, been doing a lot with omega threes, um, how they're beneficial and how omega sixes are harmful. So I have a few research papers, um, that are submitted and also magnesium deficiency. I have, uh, a large review paper on that uh, coming out and all the way, what are the real ways that we should be kind of testing for magnesium deficiency? Cause I think there is a, um, you know, there's a, a lot of misinformation out there on how to diagnose it. Yeah. So how, how do we diagnose it? Yeah. Well, um, one of the best ways, uh, the gold standard is actually an IV magnesium load test, yes. but fortunately that requires someone to, you know, 24 hour urinalysis and, um, an IV, literally an IV magnesium load in the hospital. Um, but probably the easiest way is um, uh, mononuclear cell uh, magnesium. And mm. so. Not uh, red it, cell magnesium. No, actually, um, in our paper, uh, red blood cell magnesium is actually worse than serum magnesium. Um, and because there's, there's these shifts that happen um, in the body, like if you um, exercise, um, a lot of the magnesium will go into the red blood cell. And it seems to be this reservoir. So there's like shifting a lot of magnesium oh, in the red blood cell. Not very reflective of a true deficiency. Yeah, is that something you can order? A mononuclear red magnesium level? 
you know, I honestly don't even know of a lab that does it. Yeah. Order. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's always, the, it's interesting that some of the best ways that we should be diagnosing mineral deficiencies, we don't even have access to it. And that's part of the problem that no pharmaceutical industry is really diving in and trying to figure out what are the best tests for probably what's driving 80% of chronic disease nowadays is just these mineral and vitamin deficiencies. Yeah, it's true. I mean, but the thing is, you know, getting magnesium, it's not patentable, you know, it's cheap and it's accessible, but yeah, I think magnesium deficiency is one of the biggest things I've seen in my practice. And honestly, I diagnose it through symptoms. The ones I said, you know, symptoms are a great, great model for actually diagnosing it because they're obvious. They have headaches, anxiety, palpitations, insomnia, constipation, muscle cramps, palpitations, all that stuff. People can report to you and, and you can just ask and you'll, you'll figure it out. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think you're, you, you hit the nail on the head is that we really need to look at symptoms. And so even with salt deficiency, low sodium levels in the blood is not even that great of a way to know if someone is deficient mm. in salt. Mm. It's really symptomatology, right? It's if you're dizzy when you go from a seated to a standing position um, or, you know, just integrating salt back into your diet and all of a sudden these symptoms of muscle cramps and spasms go away. That's a much better way to diagnose yourself than yeah. even yeah. looking at the sodium levels. Yeah, you know, you just, you just see those the sort of classic salt deficient patients, often they're tall, thin women who have anxiety and who have palpitations, feel dizzy when they stand up and you give them salt and they do so well. I, I often give them licorice, uh, which is actually helps you retain salt. It's a, it's a, got a mineral a corticoid effect. So it's very, very powerful. Now, what about something you just mentioned? I want to just take another couple of minutes because uh, you piqued my curiosity. Now, the current recommendations, uh, and I'm going to talk about fat because it's one of my favorite subjects. The current recommendations from the American Heart Association, from top scientists around the world, is we should be cutting saturated fat and we should be increasing our vegetable oils, corn oil, canola oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, all these oils that we never consumed 100 years ago. And, and you sort of mentioned briefly that you're doing a paper on the dangers of omega-6s, which is these refined vegetable oils. And it's okay to eat them from nuts or seeds. But you can't get that much from those. How much nuts can you eat? But you can down a lot of vegetable. I mean, in fact, 10% of our calories are these soybean vegetable uh, refined omega-6 oils. So what is, what is it that you're finding that, about these? And how, and how would you counter someone who says, well, all the data show that uh, PUFAs are better for you and you should increase your vegetable oil consumption to reduce heart disease because it lowers LDL? Right, exactly. And, and you kind of just kind of answered it, right, is we've literally just demonized um, saturated fat due to it potentially raising LDL, and we've kind of given a health halo to these vegetable oils simply based on this one surrogate marker because it lowers LDL. Um, kind of like salt, right? The one surrogate marker, it lowers blood pressure, so we think it's going to translate into a reduction in strokes and heart attacks. And it's just not as simple as A leads to B leads to C. Um, but even if you look at any of the randomized studies, any study that has actually replaced saturated fat with vegetable oils has almost always shown an increase in coronary heart disease mortality. Um, and what the what you know what was unfortunate, the 2015 dietary guidelines did not include Chris Ramsden meta-analysis that showed that replacing saturated fats with vegetable oils actually led led to harm. They excluded the meta-analysis. Yeah. I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Um, that's selective reporting. Um, yeah. What ends up happening with these omega-6s, like you said, if you get it from nuts and seeds, you have this protective coating protecting the omega-6 from going rancid, and nature is very smart. It packs those nuts and seeds with vitamin E to prevent that omega-6 from going rancid. Yeah. It's, that is so different than something that is being stripped of, let's say, seeds – and now it's being exposed to high heat, it's already full of these lipid peroxides before you even ingest it. And even if you get an well, it's organic... It's like rancid fat you're eating. You're honestly just drinking rancid fat, exactly. And even if you consume like uh, an organic omega-6 that hasn't been high heat extracted, the problem is, is your stomach is a bioreactor. And so when that omega-6 without a coating from nuts or seeds is hitting the low pH of your stomach, it forms lipid hydroperoxides, and it forms all these other harmful effects on these, especially these uh, aldehydes, which can bind to DNA and protein and, and severely damage our bodies. So you're consuming this oil that is very susceptible to oxidation, and that's why, and, and that go, those harms are, are much worse than a reduction and any type of benefit you would get from a reduction in LDL. 
But you're, what you're saying is it's such a contradiction because, you know, guys like Walter Willett from Harvard, these, they've done huge population studies. Now, they're, they don't prove cause and effect, but they've, they've taken all that data and go, you know, we really should be eating more vegetable oils and less saturated fat. And, and it's sort of really going counter to the prevailing wisdom. I mean, how do you reconcile that? Like, what would you say to Walter Willett? Yeah, when that's he's... such a good question. I love it. And yeah. so there's, there's a couple of things going on, right? Most of the studies combine omega-6 intake totally. They don't just look at vegetable oils. So they combine, you know, omega-6 from nuts and seeds and everything and say, okay, um, those who are consuming the highest amounts are at the lowest risk of heart disease. They don't ever actually tease out and say, nope, who's the population consuming high amounts of vegetable oils? So they don't really strip the two out in general. Mm. The part is that everybody's consuming high amounts of omega-6. And so the population studies never actually find a population that are consuming a low amount. Low amount, of right. Exactly. Yeah. So you're consuming basically someone who's consuming high amounts with very high amounts. And then the other factor um, is they look at blood omega-6 levels. And they say people with the lowest blood omega-6 are at the highest risk of heart disease. The problem is, is inflammation reduces omega-6 in the blood because it's susceptible to inflammation and oxidation. And so it's, a, it's actually reverse causation is what's going on. People with low omega-6 in the blood that are at higher risk of cardiovascular events is due to the underlying inflammation that is lowering their omega-6 in the blood. It's not the intake. It's amazing, yeah. The other thing I think you, know, you, you might have noticed is that a lot of the studies that showed benefits of these polyunsaturated fats include omega-3s. And when you separate out the studies that just look at omega-6s without omega-3s, they actually show harm which is what you're talking about, the Ramson meta-analysis and the Sydney Heart Trial. And even, you know, even the most recent Minnesota Cornea Experiment uh, review of the data was, was where they looked at saturated fat. This was a study that could never be done now because it was, you know, there's, there's, it's very hard to do nutritional studies. Most of them are population studies which look at food frequency questionnaires. They don't prove cause and effect. They find associations. There's other things that can explain it. But a randomized controlled trial is a more definitive study. And, and it's almost impossible to do those nutritionally because you got to lock people up, feed them different diets for a long period of time and see what happens. But you know, free living humans don't behave. They go out and eat ice cream when they're not supposed to or they do other things. So what they did was they took a population of mentally ill patients in a mental hospital, and which you know, would now would be unethical to do. And they gave half of them saturated fat, high saturated fat diet, and half of them uh, omega-6 diet, uh, corn oil. And they found that even though the cholesterol was lowered for the corn oil, I mean, in fact, for the, every 30 point drop of the LDL, they found a 22% increase in heart attacks and deaths. So even though their cholesterol quote got better, they died <laughs> and they got a heart attacks compared to the saturated fat group, which at that time was like close to 20% saturated fat in that group, which was pretty striking, and they increased the vegetable oils to like 300 times, 300 percent. I mean, uh, in the in the omega six group. So that was a compelling study for me because it's very hard to do those studies. We're probably not going to get them again, and the data was really good. And these studies are very well done. It was an NIH funded study, very rigorously done by great scientists who actually believed the opposite and didn't publish the data. They hid it in the basement for 40 years until. Doctors uh, Ramson and Hiblin actually started to ask questions and dig around. And there's a great, I don't know if you heard it, uh, James, there's a great podcast by Malcolm Gladwell on his podcast, Revisionist History, exactly about this story, looking at how this got buried, what happened, and the data around it. It's pretty fascinating. <laughs> yeah, very cool stuff. It's great. Any parting words you want to share? Uh, just stay salty. Stay yeah. salty. All right. So everybody get the salt fix. Uh, check out Dr. Nicolantonio's work. Uh, his research papers are amazing. I love them. And uh, his website is what? TheSaltFix.com. TheSaltFix.com. Okay, great. Well, great to have you on the show, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, see you, Mark.